It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. Yep, it's silly time. It's time for Taxi TV Live. This week, starring special guest star, Mr. Steve Barton. Yeah, baby. Woo! Big celebration for 2018. And welcome to the big show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. This guy is a rock star on Taxi TV. You guys probably remember that we had him on almost two years ago, I think. Um, I went to his studio when he still lived in Studio City, was it? Or um, Sherman Oaks. Sherman Oaks, close enough. And uh, he was so kind in letting me come over and bring all of my crap and set up in his studio. And he showed us how to make a tension cue. Um, with nothing more than an acoustic guitar and well, oh, we did swamp keys. Yeah, oh, that's right. But you did a swampy tension cue later, right? It, it was kind of uh, uh, drama. It was sort of dramedy-ish with the guitar, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're both swampy. And uh, everybody was so impressed. It's like, really? That's all I have to do? And the answer was, yeah. You may be overthinking it. So welcome back. And first of all, let me just give you a little background. Um, Steve Barton is, I wrote, he's pretty humble and unassuming. That's true. But he probably shouldn't be. That's also true. Because uh, he's racked up a ton of credits, learned a lot about several facets of creating music for media along the way. Also true. We never lie. Um, he's a multi-instrumentalist who plays guitar, piano, violin, and many other stringed instruments. Uh, those skills are translated into him becoming a production music composer for film, TV, commercials, corporate videos, and the like. Uh, his music can be heard on TV somewhere in the world on a daily basis. Uh, he's, his music's been on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC Family, A&E, American Heroes Channel, Animal Planet, Biography Channel, Bravo, Bravo, The Cooking Channel, Discovery Channel, E, Food Network, Game Show Network, HGTV, Investigation Discovery, Lifetime, MTV, National Geographic, do you believe your music's been on all those places? <laughs> National Geographic Channel, Oprah Winfrey Network, commonly known as OWN, uh, Outdoor Channel, Oxygen, PBS, Science Channel, Style Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, TL, Look, these are alphabetical. Travel Channel, True TV, Univision, Univision, sorry, VH1, and many, many more. Steve's also written jingles and theme songs for Los Angeles uh, radio personalities Mark and Brian and Kevin and Bean. They come in pairs. Um, and recently released his first book, which is why I want him to come by today, Writing Production Music for TV. Yeah, there we go. The Road to Success. How do I, you know? It's really hard to operate in reverse. Anyway, um, here is the the tabbed version of the book because yes, once again, I did my homework. So, welcome to the show, or welcome Thank back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, last time you and I did the thing together at your place, uh, you showed us how remarkably simple it was to do a cue. And then when I read this book, I went, "Wow, there's so much beneath the surface." Um, mm -hmm. You've learned a lot over the years about not only the musical side, but how the industry works, and there, do a great a job lot, explaining there's it. There's a lot to it all, thank you. And, um, I mean, honestly, I, I couldn't have done it without what I've learned from Taxi. Um, not only Taxi TV, <laughs> yeah. um, the rally, and, right. and you know, um, all the uh, people I've met, all the other composers, you know, make great friendships. You know, we see everybody. It's a big reunion every year, every November. It, it is. It's, it's like better than a class reunion because it's not once every 10 years and we all have kind of grown up together i think you know it's, yeah it's fantastic i i feel like i've grown with you guys because it's not like i've been sitting up there at the top of the mountain going come little people learn you know it's like i really feel like we've all kind of learned together yeah and yeah. Uh, maybe that's why it's organically kind of wonderful um so we're going to Talk about a range. Oh, hello! I, I didn't even say hello to you guys in the uh, in the chat room yet, but let me quickly say hello to Ron, Dean, Sherry, Linda, Patrick, Cass, uh, Mark, Emily, Matt, Vanderbo. You made it back, dude. Um, well, hi to uh, Amanda. She said she was getting up at midnight to watch this. Uh, she's in Ireland, so that's why. <laughs> uh, Michael Wilson, Gloria Covington, Adriana. Wow. Uh, Justine, man, oh man, the names are going by too quickly now, but hi, Anne. Anne House is in the house. Peter Rayhill. Uh, anyway, hi, all you guys and gals. Great to see you. Um, so let's get right down to it because I wrote, I think, nine pages worth of notes, and um, I'm going to ask you this stuff. 
I got that out of the way already. Got that done. Okay, so now... Oh. Um, I answered one of my own questions by reading the book, which, by the way, I have read that entire book at this point. I literally started I about... I appreciate ten, it. I started 10 <laughs> days ago and finished it up this morning in bed at 6.30 and then came back today and went to all my dog-eared pages. Well, I, I can tell you, first of all, thank you for letting me promote the book on, on your show. It's you worth reading. You mentioned it a few shows ago. Yeah. And you made me laugh because you said two things that just cracked me up. <laughs> you said... I haven't read this yet, but I want to share it, yeah. which was really nice, and I appreciate that. Well, I had started but, reading. I'd but you it. also said, because uh, I had given it to you at the rally, right? and you said, I was having trouble falling asleep, so I started to read Steve's book. <laughs> <laughs> so, what an endorsement. Thank you. <laughs> yes. They, they, he should have just called it sleepy time. <laughs> uh, no, I... I I did start to read it and knew the quality was there, and of course I cherry-picked where I went in the book because I know so much that how could I possibly <laughs> learn anything? And I looked at specific areas, I thought, huh, I'd like to learn more about that, and sure enough, you know, there, were, there was stuff in there where I went, oh, I, I didn't know that. Okay. So yeah, okay. I was very happy and proud of you. Um, so the difference, I, I should preface this. Um, Steve is one of the few people I know that does scoring and does instrumental cues. A lot of people will say they do scoring and do instrumental cues. I think it means in many cases they would like to do more scoring, um, and they do instrumental cues. In Steve's case, he's actually done quite a bit. Now, has he scored any Spielberg films yet? Mm, not no. to the best of my knowledge. No. <laughs> but... Um, he, he's done a lot of indie films and a lot of animated stuff, which I actually have a specific animation question. But what mm. is the difference between... Uh, there are many differences. But while I make it cooler in here, can you go through what the differences are between writing score and writing instrumental cues? Oh, absolutely. And I'll be right back. Great. So, all right. So while Michael's gone... <laughs> um, you know, we talk about being a film composer, and a, a film composer, in the traditional sense, is somebody who um, is hired on to score a picture. Um, he's privy to the script, he's working with the director, he has timing notes, and he's writing music specific to every scene in the film. Right. He's trying to capture certain emotions or, or generate emotions that the audience will react to. For production music composers, we're actually doing the exact same thing. We're writing music that conveys an emotion. Right. The big you're, you're writing. Oh, go ahead. But the big, the big difference is we're writing blindly. We don't know what we're writing to. So that's why it's, it's important as a production music composer to write music that sticks with an emotion. Mm -hmm. And One emotion. One emotion. Because if it's jumping all around, you know, how they're going to place it. Is that going to fit exactly in the scene? Unlikely. If it's got multiple emotions or... or people try to write a cue like a score sometimes. Yeah, I say it's like if you had a crystal ball, you, you could write a cue that would fit into all these uses. Hopefully your, your cues in production music is going, are going to get used multiple times. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a film score composer is going to write a cue that's going to get used one time. And that's for that scene in that movie. There are some pretty famous libraries that I'm sure you're aware of where a famous composer has taken all their outtake cues that didn't make it into films or stuff that was in, in films so small that they retained all the rights to it and they shoved it in a library and tried to repurpose it for other people to use. The only use that I've seen that recurs a lot for those is temp music, temp score for big feature films. Right. But as far as yanking part of, you know, taking part of a Hans Zimmer score and putting it in a TV commercial doesn't work all that well. <laughs> it, it really doesn't because if it's written for a specific purpose, it's it's intended to follow a certain arc. Right. Certain actions occur on the screen, and if the music is doing its job, it's you know it's working correctly. But in production music, that all those different movements mean nothing. So here's what happens in production music. The real composer is the music editor. 
But we okay. had that great panel at the rally, which was fantastic, and I can't remember the woman's name. Oh, you were in there for that. Oh, was that not maybe the best thing that's was, ever been it, on that stage? It was the best. It was the best one. I'm for all you people that I told that to, you are very, very bad for not being there. <laughs> all right, because this editor, Laurel, Laurel Ostranger, Ostranger. Okay. Yeah, I, this I, past year. First, I, I don't. Yes. yes yeah. But it was blonde hair, big glasses, very smart, it was great teacher. It was fantastic. Yeah. So her job is to look at the, the scene that's happening on the on the TV mm -hmm. and choose music that fits in the different pieces of, of film. So she's acting as a film composer would. She would say, okay, for these five seconds, um, there's excitement, and then all of a sudden it stops and it gets sad, and then it go, then it gets happy. And so she's, that's why when you, you look at your cue sheets, you know, from your PRO, your cues last five seconds or 20 seconds, you right. know, if you're lucky. I mean, and if you're a rookie, you wouldn't understand that. They're always very short. It's because, and, it, and this especially in reality TV, they, they're putting in 100, 200 drops throughout a 30 minute show, which is, you know, 20, 20 minutes of. And a lot of quick finish. cuts, and that's why they need to go from curious to satisfied to whatever the right. emotions are yeah so that's why i think it's important to stick with a single emotion in the cues that you're writing because that will increase your chances of a longer cue so if, if you have a piece of music that only five seconds is what they're looking or, or fits in mm -hmm. that scene but then after that it go, you, you go on to something else they're going to have to choose something else then to follow that but they love those five seconds but they, ha but they can't use the rest. And additionally, if I might add, um, let's say that your cue tries to be three or four different things within 90 seconds or two, two and a half minutes, and the juicy part that that editor might need for that scene doesn't appear until a minute and 34 seconds in, they'll never find it. Exactly. So, so that's they have to know what it is from the minute they hit play. Yeah, that's, that's a rookie mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stick with one emotion, um, have variations on it, but keep it in that in that vein that emotional vein for the entire length of the cue now there are exceptions of course there's always cues that 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 change um, speed change emotion change direction multiple times and sometimes an editor can find use for it mm -hmm. but it's pretty rare actually it'd be like a one in a thousand or or even higher odds mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, people love to point out the, the exception. I say stick with the rule because the exception is a, is a, a bad bet. Right. You know, it, it, yeah, it happens, but you're going to make more money by going with the rule. Yeah. So if, if you think, you know, I want to be a film composer, you are a film composer. Um, you're just doing it a little bit differently. So do it in a way that helps the process, not hinders it. Um, you said something quite brilliant in the book, which is the difference between scoring to picture and creating instrumental cues is that um, cues are reusable. Mm -hmm. I love that word. I've got to hand it to you. As long as I've been doing this, I've never heard anybody say a cue is reusable, but it is. It, it can be used here or there or there over a period of time, whereas a score is specific. Right. And I thought that was the most succinct Oh, explanation uh, just that was worth the price of the book right there um, okay so along those lines I made a note when scoring the picture including emotion in the way you compose scores seems obvious uh, because the emotion is already present so you've got let's say you're scoring an indie film uh, you've probably got a script, I'm imagining, and you've got the final edit, or at least close to final edit of the film, and maybe you're working with the director, the executive producer. Um, do they just hand you the indie film and say, go for it, Steve, or do they give you notes and say, this scene where she says, you know, you're breaking my heart, we're looking for something deeper than a little heartbreak, we're looking for something really tragic. Do they give you any depth of explanation in the emotion that they want, or do they leave it to you to figure that out? It, it depends on the, the knowledge and experience of the filmmaker, the director, typically. Uh, let's assume that they're beyond college level and that they've made several indie films and they're mm -hmm. fairly knowledgeable. Yeah, then they've, they, they have an exact idea of, of what they want you to do to help the audience feel a certain way. And it doesn't always have to mirror exactly what's happening on the screen. And I mm -hmm. use an example in the book um, 
in the movie Jaws. You know, kids are playing on the beach, frolicking along, la di da da da, and then you hear the da 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 da. Okay, that music doesn't really match the scene, but it's telling you something. Right. It's 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 forcing you to. Well, we've already made this connection before with the shark. So when we hear that note, we know that something something scary is going to happen. It's telegraphing the emo the thing that's about to come. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so it can be reflective. It can you know do exactly. But the other thing is, too, is that sometimes you want to, on the screen, it may appear that the character's happy, but then you might hear the music um, betraying the character, saying, you know what, this guy's really a bad guy. Don't really believe the smile on his face. Mm -hmm. So that's up to the director to instruct you that this is what we want the audience to feel. Do they Bring usually, if they're somewhat experienced, give you that? Oh, those, absolutely. Those notes? Yeah. Um, and if they're not developed enough that, or expert enough that they're able to do that and they lean on you a little bit, how receptive are they to you going, well, this scene feels like it should do this? Do, do they usually... Again, it depends on how experienced or inexperienced they are. Often they will, and, and, and the pattern today is that they will temp score the entire film. They'll pull soundtracks from whoever, you know, and John who, Williams or... Who's Alex laying that in? Just the video editor is right. grabbing stuff. Okay. Yeah, there's a you know he'll have the same dis the director will have the same discussion with the video uh, the music editor, uh, film editor and say you know I want it sad here. Okay, I'll go find a score. Yeah, that works. Let's do that. <laughs> and then what happens? They ha they get locked in temp <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, they're so no used problem. to <laughs> they're so used to seeing the film right. with John Williams' music in it that by the time you come along and bring your music to it, it's pale in comparison and then they hate it <laughs> my, my response to that would be pay me like john williams and i will get that good i promise uh, a famous uh, composer whose uh, score was thrown out was alex north wow. when he scored 2001 a space odyssey they had temp tempted it with all this classical music and they uh, a stanley Kru stanley kubrick yeah. fell so in love with the temp score that when alex north went to the premiere he was shocked to find his music was not in the film anymore. They didn't even tell him. Oh, that had to hurt. <laughs> oh, could you imagine sitting there with your wife, maybe your kids, all your friends? Yeah, throw me a bone. Let me know ahead of time. <laughs> oh, go. crap. Poor guy. Um, so when you sit down to do a cue, the flip side of this, and you sit down to do an instrumental cue, that you, a reality show because they use so much, and it's probably one of the more common uses, and you know that you're going for a type of emotion. I'm guessing that you've been doing this long enough now where you know um, almost every reality show is gonna have tension, resolution. It's a classic mm -hmm. script thing. I mean, almost, dra almost all dramas have mm -hmm. tension and resolution. So do you sit down and go, well, if I'm gonna put my money on a horse, it should be tension because if I can't think of anything else to write at the moment, that's a good default genre to go to? Right, well, here's the thing, when you're just writing a cue blindly and you have no idea how it's gonna be used, so you just write, well, I, I think I want it to be, have some tension, I want it to be sort of melancholy or sad, so I'll use a minor chord, that's you know, a good starting point. But then, this is where most people fall off in that you really need to know exactly what emotion you're aiming for. Try to picture in your mind how this will be used. Because the better you have that idea, the editors, when they hear this cue, go, that's exactly the one I want. Mm -hmm. right? Because you've already, you've already written it to a picture in your mind. Um, if yeah. you can't just make it up in your mind, go to YouTube and watch some video and score that scene. Even if that's it's a great suggestion. 10 seconds long, write that emotion and then work that out for that cue. Now you have that cue and when you're creating your metadata and your keywords, You've, you've got these, these moods, these emotions, you've already defined, and then that's what you put down, and that's what they're going to use. I'm going to do something really dangerous, because we're only 20 minutes into the show, and this next thought that I'm going to express could really um, kind of summarize the whole show, but the, you're, you're laying it at my doorstep, and I don't want to pass up this opportunity to pass this along to you guys, which is what you just said is basically create an ecosystem for the cue. It's more than just the music. It's it's the emo root emotion translated into a musical thing that conveys the emotion, which relates to the keywords because that makes it more easily findable by the person who needs it. 
now let's talk about the title. Um, okay. Uh, talk about titles, because I don't want to give this all away without letting you speak to it. Well, but. titles are extremely important, um, because when a music editor is searching for cues, they have a, an application where they're going to just type in a bunch of keywords. They're going to say uh, action, fighting, car chase, sword fights, or something, and it's going to come off of it's going to return a list of cues that have met that search criteria based on the metadata that's already been uh, installed in, in, in the files. And then they're going to start playing through them and see if each cue works well. So let's say it comes up with 500 titles. And they start playing through them, but they're looking at, at the cue titles, and the, and, and the first one says, because they're alphabetical, action cue number one. Doesn't everybody go for eight titles like Acme, you know, Dynamite? <laughs> well, and that's, so that's, that's a huge problem because that doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell right. me about the action, you know. If right, it, is it jumping off a building or a car race? Or, yeah, yeah if, if the cue is titled Sword to the Throat. Something like that, you know. It's it, yeah. it has a little bit of meaning. It it's sort of visual, and it kind of defines what is what the style is. Mm -hmm. It can't tell you everything, so they're going to have to listen to it. But at least they're going to be gra they're going to gravitate towards that. It's just human nature. Yeah, it's obviously with a title like "Sword to the Throat," you know, it's not going to be um, a bunch of Camaros smoking tires through San Francisco. Right. Now, I. I had a talk with Matt Hurt, and he gave me this great suggestion, and I wish I had known about it before before the book came out. He said, you know what, since they do a search and they all come out in alphabetical order, I try to name my cues starting with the letter A. Well, that's what I was saying, Acme, you know, it's like, <laughs> or triple A this, triple A that. Right, so um, all my cues are going to be aardvark this and aardvark that. Right. <laughs> I mean, it could be um, a sword to the throat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a race through the city. Yeah. Um, an emotional breakdown, a romance gone bad. Yeah. That's brilliant. Every cue you write should start with the letter A. <laughs> Every um, title of it. Tra uh, Tracy and Vance Marino gave an example in the book. They said, uh, rather than naming it Happy Song, call it Sunshine in a Cup. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden that has a little bit more meaning. Now, some libraries are going to re retitle your tracks regardless. Right, and that would be typically a non-exclusive library where you're going to own the, the original master and the original copyright and they're going to do um, a, a retitle and do it non-exclusively just for those of you who don't know. I, I work with exclusive libraries that retitle them anyway just because they want their own naming convention ah. or they just have something to them it has a better meaning. Right. So you can't always guarantee that what you call it is going to fit but a lot of them do. They will let you you know keep your title um, when, but when, it's important. When they're going to retitle it, um, I've had people call me up, taxi members call me up, they got a deal through taxi and say, oh my gosh, um, this company wants to retitle my grand opus, I can't believe it, they find it so offensive. It, my advice to them is, so what? It means it's going to get used more, move on, because you could do 200 more of these cues this year. That one is not so special, but people are really offended by that, and I, I understand it. it, you know, it's the color, the certain color of red they use in their painting, and it is their art, but a cue is not really like a record. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not, well, it's more um, you're of making, the moment. You're making widgets, basically, and you have to get yeah. over the fact that it's it's really not art. It kind of is, you know, you, you need to put your heart into it, and you need yeah. to create good work, but it's just a widget. It's a different kind of art. The art is knowing the arc and how to, you know, everything you're talking about, um, translating the emotion, sticking with an arc and understanding that um, an introspective piece might not have the same kind of arc because a scene wouldn't have the same kind of arc as a dramatic or a chase scene, mm -hmm. an action mm -hmm. scene. Yeah, and that, that comes with the experience Excuse in me. just being a skilled composer, understanding how arcs work and how to build uh, a dramatic, and we use the word dramatic in, in any sense, it could be comedy, but in a dramatic sense. Um, so it has to start from point A and go to point B, and it has to grow in some way, either, you know, in intensity or, you know, it has to build into something. People, uh, I have a good friend who is a very smart individual, 
and a really talented musician and a talented composer. And he's not part of the regular taxi crowd at all. So I'm not telling tales out of school. You guys don't have to guess who he is because you won't know him. And he sent me a, a bunch of cues that he had written and wanted me to check them out and say, oh, the, you know, these would be good for this company or that company. And as I was listening to stuff, my wife walked in the room and she said, that's really good. And I said, yeah, it is, but there's one thing that was lacking in some of them, not all of them, just in case you're watching. Um, and that is, even though they were well composed, well, super well played, super well engineered, super well produced, and it followed all the rules of good cue craft, some of them were lacking in emotion. Mm. And I was having a real, really hard time putting my finger on how to get back to him and say, you know, this one feels like it's, it, everything else about it is so good, but it's 10% down on the emotion scale. I don't have enough musical talent in my brain to be able to say, you know, try in, in a different inversion on this chord, or maybe don't go to the seventh right there, or don't use a minor. But it's funny how that stuck out. Even a, anybody who listened to it would go, excellent craft in every regard, but only somebody who's listened to a zillion cues would go, it's 10% less good than it's got to be on the emotion mm -hmm. scale. I just, it was notable. Well, we tend to write in a vacuum, and I do recommend, if, if this is still kind of new to you, to try to write to picture. Mm -hmm. Just get the feel of trying to translate music into emotion and, and have it work with picture. How do you know when you've done a good job of that? as the person doing it because well first of all it gets easier yeah you're able to pick out the notes and the chords and you know and, and the color of the orchestration to make it work um do you ever oh your wife is a musician right no she's a voiceover artist oh that's right i knew she did something creatively <laughs> so who when you were early on this stuff and knew who did you ask for opinions to find out if you were getting it right and getting better over time um, well, I've been doing this a long time, and I didn't really get into production music until much later. So I had already been doing writing the picture and stuff. Oh, okay. So I had kind of gotten the experience doing that. Yeah. But even writing, you know, going into this area, it's a little different than writing the picture. So um, honestly, you know, the Taxi Forum is really where I, I kind of got started with everything. Uh, how long have you been a member? For like 15 years or something? Yeah, I think it's around 10. 10 years, okay. Um, so, when, I know that you've done a fair amount of animation stuff, um, and I should also mention that Kevin um, met a composer named Kevin Kiner at the Road Rally probably five, six years ago, and struck up a relationship with him and ended up working on some pretty highbrow stuff, um, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, I think, and one other? Yeah, he did uh, CSI Miami oh, and right. uh, Star Wars Clone Wars anima animation. Right. And so you obviously had to learn something from him because he's a pretty A-listy guy. Um, how do you, what would you say is different about scoring animation as opposed to live action? Are there any differences? Do you have to make it more obvious or less obvious or any, are there any rules that change when working with animation? It really, it really isn't. I mean, it depends on the type of animation. If it's if it's a dramatic animation, like a Star Wars, Clone Wars kind of thing, it's no different than a, than live, action. a live action Star Wars movie. Interesting. But if you're doing a Looney Tunes kind of animation, Carl Stalling style of music, yeah. that's really different. <laughs> Break out the xylophone or, or the marimbas. Uh -huh. um, so when you get a project, let's say that you're going to do a Looney Tunes type of project, do you sit down and do a pre-analysis and go, okay, these are instruments that say, I'm comedic. Um, these are um, modes or scales or whatever that tend to be more comedic. And do you study that so that you've oh got those arrows in that quiver for that job? I studied Carl Stalling. He did all the Warner Brothers cartoons. Yeah. And I, I did some work in the early 90s for Saban. Uh. And I did a lot of cartoons, and I, I thought I was going to be Carl Stone. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was trying to emulate his style. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a mother. It's really difficult. And of course, it makes I, it sound so easy, though. Yeah, and I didn't, you know, I'm not working with a real orchestra. I'm using, you know, in those days it was really crappy MIDI equipment. Right. And it just sounds horrible. 
Um, but I did learn a lot. I mean, I, I studied a lot. And at that time, there was a, a single um, CD out of isolated score of, of the Carl Stalin stuff, which was, was a great learning experience. And I also got to hang out in those days. I was going to UCLA Extension, and I, I got to hang out at the Warner Brothers stage when they were doing um, um, Animaniacs. Oh, really? And at that how, time, how, what do you mean I got to hang out? They just called up and said, "Hey, Steve-O, want to come over and hang out?" No, I. How does that happen? No, I was I, one of my uh, instructors was Mark Waters, uh -huh. and he was friends with Richard Stone, who was the music director for the show. Wow. And I said, you know, you think I could go hang out? You know, and he said, Yeah, here's Richard's number. Call him up, and he's the nicest guy in the world. And so I've been lying all these years. I've been telling people you don't need to live in L.A. to be in the music industry. It certainly helped. It helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, wow, what a great experience that must have been. So, uh, were there any eye-opening moments where you went, oh, that's how they do it? it? When you see a live orchestra perform the music, it's really different, because then you can kind of see it when the players play something. Yeah. It's like, it's stuff that's sort of subliminal, and you don't really hear it, and then when you see them perform it. Um, in fact, um, one of the, actually up, right up here in Calabasas, uh, Mark Waters was doing Goof Troop, it was a Disney show, okay. and, it, and I would go up and hang out with him too. And they did it, it was pretty much a MIDI synth score, supplemented with one violin, one flute, one trumpet, one bassoon, add the sense one, tr of realism. one trombone, and that made it sound so real. It tricks the brain. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and where were they doing it in Calabasas? I didn't know we you had know, that I, level of... Uh, this is 25 years ago, so I, I don't remember exactly uh, okay. where, where it was. It was a small studio up here. Yeah? Was it the one across the street from Calabasas High? Do you remember? If, uh... I, I don't remember. Okay, because there used to be a studio. Calabasas High would be on your left, and then there was a studio on the right-hand side. Could have been that. Um, seeing I'm going down my list of questions. Be right with you. Do you consider <laughs> most often you? Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here, while I'm reading, just look at that, okay? Um, oh, let's talk about uh, different keys. Yeah, like a subscribe. Yeah, you know what to do, right? Um, <laughs> different keys, major, minor, different voicings, tempo, rhythmic considerations. Do you do any sort of analysis? Um, we were, we're talking before the show, uh, uh, somebody that we both know has done kind of a mathematical analysis of, of maybe what works and what doesn't work, uh, and how many cues per show, all, all this stuff. And I, I want to look at more of an artsy-fartsy analysis rather than so mathematical. So when you sit down to create something and you know the emotion and you know that that's going to be the central musical theme from the beginning to the end of a two-minute cue, let's say, um, do you know when you start in that moment that you're going to be working in a minor? Do you know um, rhythmically that if you did this that it would take it out of that emotion? Did the, has that stuff become on a gut level now or do you still have to think about what, oh, no. the, what the ingredients to your stew are going to be? I, I definitely still have to um, think about it yeah. and, and I, I still study show, what shows are using. Like if I'm interested in writing for uh, you know, shows that, that use a lot of crime drama tension stuff. Yeah, I need to watch those shows and listen to the music that they're that they're using, so I can really understand the instrumentation that they're using. Because like now, I'm starting to get uh, calls for traditionally crime drama stuff is just sort of orchestral, mm -hmm. uh, like a pulsing bass line. Name a show so they can uh, further imagine. Uh, any of the uh, investigation discovery shows, um, you know, like a Dateline. Okay, uh, is a good example of show. Um, but you know now they're asking for like with hip hop drums. Interesting. So it's really the same exact thing, just add hip hop drums. Wow. And and I'm I'm not really strong in hip hop, so I'm actually you know learning hip hop. Right yeah. Now. You know, so I'm just a beginner in that. Um. What's he just died? The famous voiceover guy that did all that stuff. Um, Peter Thomas, uh, was the voice of, of so many of those shows. Mm. And. 
excuse me, when I used to live and work in New York, I recorded him all the time, like once or twice a week. He, he, he was a legend in the voiceover industry. Your wife would certainly know. Your wife's name is Leanne, right? Mm -hmm. She would know who he is in a heartbeat. Anyway, Peter Thomas, the minute to this day, if I hear his voice on anything, it makes my shoulders tight because I know somebody's getting their head cut off. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, forms or structures. Let's talk about the different forms because people think that, sometimes think uh, when they're early in the game and just starting out that, hey, I do instrumental stuff, so I'm just going to do three minutes of floaty, dreamy, pretty pads, and I've got this library. Oh, it sounds so pretty. There's a structure to cues. There are several structures to cues. Can you name what some of them are? Uh, well, the typical structure is, is going to be an ABA format. So you have an A section, which is your main thematic piece, a B section, which is similar but different, and then the final A section is basically the same as the first A section, but with some variation. Um, what type of variation? Uh, let's let's use an example. So let's say that you're doing um, an action piece, and it's got the ABA form. So do you have an intro? Is it long, short? If you have one at all, how long might it be in the number of bars? You know, it varies with composers. I prefer no intros. I just prefer to get right into it. Man after my own heart. <laughs> Not that I compose, but if I but did. <laughs> one thing I, d I did learn from that, um, the, the music editor session was that she liked cues that had a little, uh, like a grace note leading into mm -hmm. into the downbeat. It didn't just start with the downbeat. It was like like a guitar going, brum, right? And it would then it would start the cue. And I thought, God, that's really clever. It's and what it a adds great a transition piece. for everybody who her name was Laurel Ostrander, and for everybody who wasn't in the room, she just kept dropping those little honey drops throughout the whole thing. Was, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you just changed my outlook. So yeah, no, okay. um, no intros, um, and the the length of of or, or the um, the length of each section is really dependent on the length of the entire piece of music that I'm writing. Based Do you on, have an average length? Based on the needs, I, I try to stick around 90 seconds okay. to two minutes max. I usually never go beyond that. I mean, if you could do two minutes and four seconds, you wouldn't be oh, freaked course. out about it. Yeah, that. if okay. it works out, but that's sort of that's my target. Mm -hmm. So let's say I say 90 seconds. So I write a piece of music, which is my A section, and I time it. And if it's you know 30 seconds long, then boom, that's one third of my my target. And I know my last third is going to be 30 seconds, so that means I get to fill in 30 seconds for the middle section. And is the B section, would the A section be more like a verse or more like a chorus? And then follow up on that is, you know what, just answer that and then I'll hit you with the follow up. Well, just from my own personal experience, nobody ever gets to my B section. Because your A section is so strong and it's more no, like a it's chorus? Just, no, just? it's just, I don't know, that's sort of the first thing you compose and that's sort of your main thematic material. Right. The B section is just something to go away from to give you a chance to be able to come back to it. Okay. Just, you know, turn to make the ear turn a little bit. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a bridge. Kind of like a bridge. My, so, my I always trick, say bridges are like a small vacation in the middle of a song. <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. My trick is always go up a minor third on the B section and then come back to the original community. Okay, yeah. and when you come back to the original key for the A section, the grand finale, as it were, um, and you introduce other elements, um, is it more layers to add thickness? Is it um, different instruments being introduced for the first time in the second visit to the A section? What's your methodology for that? It depends on, on, on the style of the music, but a lot of times when I come back to that final A section, bring it in with very few instruments. So really? like all of a sudden, then oh, you're, you're when changing. you bring when you come back from the B, go back to the A. You bring so you start out skinny. Yeah, again. <laughs> so it almost sounds like a, like a third section. Okay, it's actually the same thing, and and then it builds and builds and builds. And do you bring it to a, a a bigger? You know, are you building, 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 and then it's ta da at the end of it a should, course. It should depending. grow and build to some kind of a climax. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'll be frank that my, my endings are not the, the most sophisticated musically. <laughs> you did it, that, 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 that. I don't think that's just you, by the way. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, we're, we're talking cues, not scoring a Spielberg film. It, yeah. And uh, as we both know, we knew this before, but had it underscored, <laughs> if I could use a pun, um, with Laurel Ostrander in the room, 
it was really good to see how she used those endings to transition from anything from like a door closing would be an edit point going into the next scene or the next room or somebody's ticked off and they slam the door and go out to the driveway to jump in their car and drive away because Kimmy couldn't get the cap on the milk carton again. Um, you want those endings to be very definitive like that to work with the edit. Well, they have, they have to be button endings. They can't fade out. Yeah. Although a button ending can mean a note that rings out. Right. Um, it, it depends on the style of music. If you're doing um, a light piano piece that's introspective, you would just go back to the root note and it would ring out. If you were doing mm -hmm. something for an action piece, it'd be more bow. Yeah. And the editors can crossfade that ring out with yeah. the start of the next cue. So that's not a problem. It's like if you watch a TV commercial and you get a note that's supposed to ring out, it's done at, at that 30 second mark. There's no, that's it, the end of right. the audio. Yeah. So you can't, it doesn't cross fade <laughs> yeah. into the next commercial. Whoa, my ring out is gone because now they're talking about Crest. <laughs> yeah, so you got, you got to think about it a little differently if you're doing ads. Uh, yeah, I always, uh, having mixed a, a gazillion of them back in the day, um, they're out 29.5 because you've got to leave room. A computer is controlling mm -hmm. how those things show up. So it's not like somebody's sitting there with a fader and a mute button wing. Oh yeah, the ring out's over. Now we can start the right, next one. Exactly. <laughs> um, going for a moment. Oh, so one of the things that we talk about in our listings and in the industry in general is baking in some sort of forward momentum. And some people think that means that everything's got to feel like it's chugging like a locomotive. Um, but then you translate that to a light, introspective piano piece, a guitar piece. How do you add forward momentum and some interest and a little bit of dynamic into something that's light and introspective and delicate in nature? As a composer, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's no e easy answer to it. It just has to work musically. You can drop instruments out and just have a, a solo instrument playing something. But eventually, other instruments have to keep coming back in and building back up to get back on that what train. What if it's solo, though? And if it's solo, um, well, you meaning like a solo piano? Yeah, solo piano piece or maybe an acoustic guitar with one other little guitar part added for salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't, usually I know the answer to the questions when I write them. I don't know the answer to this one, I will admit that. So how do you, as a composer, keep it interesting and give it a sense of maybe momentum is the wrong word but so it just doesn't sound like oh here's the same arpeggio over and over and over again are there any well, compositional key, tricks sure key changes modulation okay so, yeah so if you change and, and never go up a half step that's really cheesy sounding yeah that's why i say a minor third works really well it's very cinematic and it, it returns to the root key easily it's just something our ears right. become attuned to so half step would be old school. That's like 1980s pop music. Think Barry Manilow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he would go half step, half step, half step. Right. You know, until he hit the top of his range, and then <laughs> they faded. Right? Exactly. <laughs> that's great advice. Um, okay, let's talk about stems, and, and this is something that I want to spend a fair amount of time on because people hear uh, stems, they hear the phrase, and they know it's some form of submix. Can we go a little deeper into the weeds on, first of all, defining stems and give some examples? Great section in the book on stems, by the way. Well, let me just say that in doing research for the book, I learned that there's not an industry standard or even an understanding of what it means when you say stems. Mm -hmm. Stems in the film world, in the traditional sense, means each of the individual tracks. Okay. Or it could be... Um, grouped, like the woodwind section is a stem, the brass section is a stem, the brass trumpet solo, that's a separate stem. Um, a lot of music libraries call alternate mixes or alt mixes stems. The terminology is all messed up throughout the industry, so I sort of use the generic term stems when, when talking about these mixes. Most of my experience and, th and this is just me because I've talked to other composers who the requirements are, are different. I do alternate mixes. So I do like a, a full mix, which is like the main song, 
for everything that you do for, you just routinely do you have to you, you got it that's your that's i mean that's your purpose for writing the music is your full no i'm two. talking about breaking it out after that uh, right and then i'll uh, always do a version without the melody because melodies uh, have a, a a good chance of interfering with dialogue right so it's sometimes they call it a bad mm -hmm. track or i just got the no melody version <laughs> right um so you've given them the full mix you've given them one without a melody um do you routinely is a matter of course give them just like a percussive stem or bass and drums stem or do you ever give like just woodwinds only or strings only how, how do you know well i sort of have rules of thumb that i use and of course the bottom line is always ask the client what do you require or what would you like mm -hmm. some of them want pure stems the, each individual track wow. so if you have nine different instruments they want each one of them represented yeah as now, a standalone working with my with my dog i will create stems anyway and that's specifically for the reason of doing backups because if i'm using um virtual instruments vsts mm -hmm. that one day I no longer own, and I have to come back to that track. I've submixed it as a an audio track. Wow, that may that's say this again slowly because this is really really important. So any virtual instruments you use today will be superseded by something better in a year or two or three. It could be three years from now somebody goes back and says, Steve, I love this piece, but I need the piano tweak. Well, let's say, you know, when we all went from 32-bit computers to 64-bit computers, mm -hmm. all those VSTs you owned before probably didn't work in the new computer. Wow. So if you pull up all these old cues and you've got all these MIDI tracks, you can't get that same exact sound anymore. So my goal is to preserve that and, and do a mix, a dry mix. I won't add any reverb on it just so I can add my own later. Yeah. But it's, sort of, it's just a backup strategy. Now, really smart and, one. And that way, those are my stems. So if somebody actually says, I need the stems, I need the individual outputs for each instrument, I've got them right there. But my rule of thumb is to create alternate mixes. And I start with a full mix, I do a no melody mix, then it depends on the style of music, and essentially you want to create something that's musically interesting. Now, music supervisor Jen Malone, she said, we use a lot of drum and bass for um because the show she works on is uh oh i forget the name of it but yeah um right they wouldn't use a lot of orchestral stuff in that show yeah or so, any orchestral yeah stuff so if though. you're doing any kind of edm electronic dance music kind of stuff chances are a drum and bass mix is going to be pertinent mm -hmm. for whatever you're doing and so it really comes down to a combination of instrument mixes that makes sense musically. It could be a, a solo flute, for all I care. If it's musically interesting, they might use it. Uh, if it's like a jazz tune, it could be just an upright bass mm -hmm. solo. You, you get rid of the piano, you get rid of the drums, you get rid of the saxophone, it's just a bass. So basically, um, for those of you who don't know a lot about stems, you're giving them a multi-track at mixed levels broken out by track or by groups of tracks that are related to each other so that they can then put all the faders at zero and go gee I wonder how this would sound if we just dropped everything out and where this guy makes a poignant remark in the film that's kind of an eyebrow raiser everything drops out except the bass going Boo -doo, boom boom exactly right. if you've got an editor who has a musical background kind of rare mm -hmm. but a lot of them do they can listen to say listen to a track and say you know what this would be awesome if we just drop that triangle out of this bar mm -hmm. well if they've got all the stems they can do that if not then they have to go back to you and say hey steve can you do me a mix without the triangle does it freak you out at all that somebody who may not have musical chops certainly not mixing chops um gets to screw around with your music and reinterpret it for their needs or not that big a deal because it's not your grand opus well, ex yeah, I you know you have to let it go. Yeah, you can't get emotionally wrapped up in your music because they're they're going to cut it up anyway. They're not going to use the whole piece. They're going to use 
four bar, four bars of it if you're lucky. You know, you just gotta realize that you're you're just providing a, a product that's going to be used at their whim. Um, the, there was a post today on, on the taxi forum about a gentleman that's been around for a long time in the forum, and um, he, he was basically talking about how frustrating it was that art wasn't recognized and that you know taxi's really good if you're making widgets or shoving commodities out the door uh, and you you said at the top of the show that that's basically the, the industry that you're in if you're making um, instrumental cues that, you know you're building widgets but yet those of you guys who I know um, men and women who are happy successful composers never seem depressed or feel like em embarrassed or anything oh I'm just putting out widgets I think that all of you share a love and passion for what you're doing because there's a different kind of creativity in creating cues. It's not musical genius, but it is still creative. Is it that is. a fair statement? Yeah, I, and for me, the the actual creation part is that's where I get the most joy out of it. When I have to do metadata, that's where I get the least joy. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because you had a great section of the book. Um, and I'm going to quote you here, it talked about the job description of TV music composer is not write music, get paid, buy yacht. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the actual composing part of the job is a tiny part of what you'll be doing. Sorry to disappoint you. The tasks included in this job consist of research, composing, recording the cue, mixing the cue, creating stems, exporting the audio. Um, we're not talking about putting it in a box and sending it to Italy, by the way. Generating metadata, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Communicating with collaborators, if you have them. Uploading the queue. Uploading, or I'm sorry, updating your catalog, meaning let's say that you're somebody like, Steve, I'm guessing you've got a thousand or more queues out there? Um, less. Okay, but hundreds? Hundreds, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, that's a, a lot of stuff to keep track of. Backing up your data, um, answering emails and phone calls, sales calls, rustling up new clients, um, creating and submitting demos, which I'm guessing isn't like, here's a demo of what I could do. It's more like, you know, here's a reel of my stuff, exactly. or a montage or something. Right. Um, networking with people, like going to the road rally. Um, so all that stuff is part of that ecosystem that we were talking about earlier that it's not just creating a lovely little piece of music there's a lot of thought that goes into it that's the business part of it that people don't want to think about but you have to right yeah you can't be if you want to be successful you have to think about the business yeah and I have a big section in the book on organization yeah how you have to break down your time and then set aside time for doing emails and answering the phone so let's go to metadata for a second and then let's talk about time allocation um, with a family because you've got one. You've even got grandkids as do I now mm -hmm. and that takes you into a whole other stage of life when they call and say I want to come over you know when your your children call and say I want to come over with the grandkids for a barbecue on Sunday pretty hard to blow them off. Exactly. Or if it's your own kids not that hard. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, now, you know, your own kids get to an age where they don't want to do anything with you, but then when they have kids, they do again. They, they start reappearing for long periods, mm -hmm. and, and you can't just blow them off. So, mm -hmm. metadata. Explain what it is and why it's important and how you use it. Um, this varies from library to library, but often you're tasked with providing metadata, which is um, essentially it's going to be like an Excel spreadsheet that's going to list every queue and every version of your queue that you're providing them. And it's going to list the title of the queue, the name of the actual file, the WAV or AIF file. Uh, it's going to have the BPM, the beats per minute. It's going to have the, the track length. Um, it's going to have the composer's name, so if you're co-composing with somebody, the, um, the PRO splits. So, um, so you get paid properly. So if it's you and two other people, that and everybody's equal, it would say, you know, Steve, Lydia, and Matt, 33 and a third, 33 and a third, 33 and a third. Exactly. Okay. Um, 
and then along with that, and that's stuff that's easy to figure out. Um, that's at your fingertips. But then you, you come up with a, usually there's a feel for like the description. Describe this cue. Well, it's a soft piano melody that invokes uh, uh, trauma, or, you know, it's <laughs> just something silly, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a traumatic cartoon, I always say. Uh, are, are most musicians capable of objectively describing this? No. Coming up? Okay. No. no. <laughs> um, and then, then keywords. Now, the keywords are the main things that are going to be searched upon by the music editors. Who and are really the deciders to a large degree about what gets used in the same, yeah. especially in reality. Too, and I have included a section in the book that I include... Uh, uh, m what we call moods, or the things that you're going to put in for keywords. So, a good starting point. I mean, there's an unlimited number of, of keywords you could use. Are keywords generally mood oriented, or typically because they're they're looking for a specific emotion, um, even if it's like an action cue. Well, and you could say action. That that's a good keyword. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a, a mood, mood, right? Right. Um, uh, Pessimist or pessimism, you know that that right. could be a mood. Uh, you know, angst. You know, a any of these things that describe the cue. Now, what editors? Right. What, what the actor is portraying in the scene, because editors aren't going to think, oh, this is a really salient point, by the way. Editors generally don't think in terms of, I need something that's got strings with a lot of cello because I love the bottom end that that gives me to convey. The, the gravitas of the scene. They think, I need something dark and moody. Right. Now, they may require something that's like a string quartet. So another column in, in the metadata might be instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So they can include that as well. And would you go as far as naming every instrument that was used if it were like a full band cue? Uh, I, I do, yeah. And especially... Well, I do a lot of orchestral stuff, so typically, you know, I'm going to say woodwinds, brass, percussion, strings. I mean, that's pretty standard. Yeah, and if you don't have an oboe solo, you would just leave it at woodwinds rather than saying oboe. But if it were oboe-centric, you might say, you know, or, or tuba. Comedic, you might break out tuba as a standalone mm -hmm. because it makes the point. That right, so that, that'll help the search. Libraries... Uh, want to make sure that you don't what they, they call metadata spamming right okay so <laughs> putting all seen that right so it's just, you know it happens uh, in, in in web searches and stuff where you, people are searching on Google for something and they come to a site and it has nothing to do with that keyword that they searched for because <laughs> they they spam keywords and it'll get you in hot water eventually so you really want to avoid doing that you want to be honest with your keywords and you want to be part of the solution not part of the problem do libraries ever smack composers on the back of the hand um, because they stuff them or spam them? And yeah, they'll stop working with you if, if you are... Will they give you fair, fair warning? Uh, no, I guess it, it depends <laughs> on, on, on how bad <laughs> your abuse is. I, I would imagine, I would hope that they call you and go, Dude, we love your work, however, you've spammed the... Yeah. You know, don't do that again if you heed the warning, I'm hoping they would continue to work. Now, creating these keywords is very time-consuming, and I, and I just hate it. And there are actually services that you can hire. You can send your queue to them, and they will create all these keywords for you. And I've talked what to... What do they charge for that? Oh, somebody told me once. It's something like $12 a queue. It's not really expensive, but if you have a lot of queues, it adds up. Um, and I've you know talked to some friends who have used services like this, and they said, yeah, it's pretty good. And well, it, nobody's ever going to think it's amazing, are they? Because well, it's their work. You know, I, I can't believe they didn't put that. Yeah, in, I mean, they, it's it's subjective. You yeah. know, it's how that music makes me feel the time at the moment I'm listening to it. I mean, if you've gotten a, a, a fight with your spouse that morning, you might not be feeling it the same way that the other person might be feeling it. You know. Yeah. M music, you know, really, uh, you know, does something to our soul. It affects. It, Affects us in different ways, and, and based visceral. on other uh, uh, extraneous uh, you know, things happening in our lives. Makes sense. Um, so, anything beyond um, the keywords? Is there anything else that we didn't mention yet for metadata? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. A phone number and email address, right? 
Well, in the case of the library, they're going to add that stuff because they're ultimately going to be the contact. Yeah, exactly. They've already got that information. They've got your contact info. Um, they're also providing your your PRO um, IPI. It was a CAE number. Right. Um, so it gets logged with PRO. So you get paid. Yeah. Um, that's always good. Okay, so now let's talk about the time allocation. Um, somewhere in the book you said that, uh, I think in this section of the book you said, the time I spend on the actual composition of the queue is tiny, I think you said in that sentence that I read a few minutes ago, um, is tiny compared to the time I spend on everything else. To a lot of musicians, I'm, I'm thinking that that might be somewhat disheartening to them. It's like, oh man, I get to do actual work? I thought I got to just sit down and create, create, create. Everybody would love me, appreciate me, and just mm -hmm. want to love my music all the time. But you could be, is it a true statement to say you could be an amazing composer, but if you don't take care of all this other stuff we're talking about, they won't work with you? Well, I, I, I actually, I, I can't remember the number I used. I might have said, you could write a million cues a year. But if you can't get the business done, nothing's going to happen with those cues. So you have to take care of all this stuff. It's a dilemma, a common dilemma that I see with composers um, and, and some composers who've created their own libraries as well um, because they've got more requests coming in than they can compose for. So they reach out to their friends and say, hey guys, let's build a little boutique library. And then they call me up going, Oh my God! I never imagined how much work this was because it's Sunday Sunday night at 9:30. They're sitting at the kitchen table doing all the metadata entry and other stuff for many of their composers, and mm -hmm. it's um, daunting to say the least. Mm -hmm. So you're saying just on um, a personal level, without creating a, a little library with your friends, that it's daunting but necessary. It's extremely necessary. Um, I've started using Keith LeBron's Composer Catalog software. I've heard nothing but oh my positive God. stuff. Um, <laughs> it's called literally called Composer Catalog. I, I, I've had the software for a while, and, and because I was keeping it, everything in a spreadsheet, I had to transfer all that stuff into his catalog, and that was very time-consuming, and, and I didn't really invest time in doing it. Yeah. But now I've started doing it. I, I actually did some beta testing for him for his, his latest version. Uh huh. I learned. I got really deep in the software and realized, oh my God, there's some features in here. I said, Keith, you got to, you know, highlight these features because there's some really cool stuff in here, and it is such an amazing tool. He's one of you guys, so it makes sense that yeah. he would create something amazing because he's actually using it. He's not some chip head sitting in a cubicle trying to imagine what you use. Exactly. He he knows what we need. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a great guy. Yeah. But they have. He's got areas in there where, where you can store all this uh, metadata stuff. Um, so when you need to use that cue for something, boom, it's already there. Do, um, does it have pull downs where if you're having a, a brain freeze and you can't think of an emotion, does he have pull down? He does or? have some, and and I, he also has the ability for you to add add to the list. Right. You know, customize it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's watching the show today or not, but uh, Keith, if you are watching the show, I've been building my own little list lately um, and could maybe share that with you. Maybe. I think about that. Uh, but we use it internally, you know, for writing the listings because a lot of times when people um, reach out to us and ask us to run a listing, the, the keywords or the emotions or the descriptors that we get from the companies, not always that good. Mm -hmm. And we have to kind of interpret and fill in the blanks. You know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about music let's actually play a little music so people can hear um, a good couple of few good examples uh, of cues. Do you have something, can you, can we play three cues um, that would be good examples of like an orchestral thing, um, a stripped down maybe swampy thing, and then an action thing? Sure. Uh, I have all three of those. I was hoping you did after I said that. <laughs> um, can you get Bria the titles and she'll find them and play them? Um, you know what? I have to go and look at the title names because okay. uh, I can't remember the... Um, go for it. While you're doing that, I'll have a sip of Rockstar Revolt from our friends at Rockstar. Okay, Dark Secrets is the orchestral one we'll do. Um, let's get out ah, of here. The refreshing. And then Swamp Town is the uh, Swamp. Oh, Scott's in the house serving pizza tonight to the chat room. Good man. 
Um, no, because Carrie Cox is wondering if his 11-year-old daughter could figure out metadata. I'm so glad. If she's watching the show, I'm so glad I've been watching my tongue. <laughs> okay, now we're ready. Please. <laughs> So that that was I was going through my Bernard Herman phase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did. You tipped your hat very nicely to him. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so many people in the chat room while that was playing were being very complimentary, um, and I noted that um, the piece w was so it sucks you in so deeply. That I didn't even notice the the arc of it so much as I was listening mm -hmm. more to the voicings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some of the chordal stuff in there going, that's kind of brilliant. It's, a, it's actually an older style of composition, too. I mean, composers aren't really writing like that. Right there, there was one chord and there, one voicing I heard, and it remi it was very 1960s. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it was totally, like I said, Bernard yeah. Herrmann. Somebody said Bass Motel, which is based on Psycho, which was, you know, Bernard Herrmann did that score. Yeah. So. Um, people were also asking like crazy, what what uh, are the string libraries you use? Uh, that one, I'm pretty sure, was Hollywood Strings. If you had to place a bet on somebody making libraries and end users happy, which I don't think that that many editors will go, unless something sounds pretty obviously bad, editors aren't going, oh, I wish they'd used Hollywood Strings or something. They just, They know bad from good but they don't know really good from great, necessarily. They just want to know that it, it sounds like real strings, and you could use the greatest library in the world, but if you don't know how to program the articulations well, so the, the notes blend and, yeah. and move from note, like a legato note into the next note, right. you know, so it doesn't sound like MIDI. Eh, eh, yeah. Eh. <laughs> so if, if you were to place a bet, on um, somebody experienced using a three hundred dollar uh, library versus somebody who's inexperienced using a five thousand dollar one, would you go with the the experienced person using the cheaper library? Would they get a better result, maybe? Uh, well, definitely the experience is going to help because you can you can make cheaper libraries sound really great if you know what you're doing. Matt Just Hurt is one of those guys that could yeah exactly he he could make. That sound great, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Matt's very smart, and he knows instruments. And whatever, whatever library you have, just learn it really, really well, and master it. Um, a lot of people don't take the time to study orchestras. Period. They don't understand how, uh, like, what a bird's eye view of an orchestra looks like. Which players sit next to which other players. Um, that this is a part that an oboe would never play. Nobody would ever write that for an oboe, right, right. or um, strings. What you know, you're writing um, 
guitar parts and expecting violins to play it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that goes a really, really, really long way because some people get a little turned off by, oh my God, I've got to learn how to do articulations really well. First thing you need to do is understand what those instruments typically do. How long and how, how did you learn that and how long did it take? Uh, well, I've been writing for orchestral instruments since the 70s. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, I, I went to college for that and... Man, are you like 85? <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to disclose my age. <laughs> I think I did once ask you, you and I are in the same ballpark, but that, that's impressive that you've been doing it that long. We are, but you are older than me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you've been doing this for 40 years? Kind of, yeah. But, you know, I started off using really crappy MIDI instruments because that's all I could afford. Um, in, when I was in college, the only time you could hear your music played was when you had real musicians to play them for you and it was very rare to get that opportunity because <laughs> they wouldn't show up for the gig <laughs> <laughs> or they were at least late right mm -hmm. um somebody also asked earlier at what point do you offer the library stems and somebody else said when they ask you is that kind of a each different library kind of has their own working pattern well here's the thing if you're just writing cues and you you haven't signed them yet you don't know what the requirements will be for whoever's going to ultimately take the, the cues. But that's, again, that's why I go back to I've already created these stems for backup purposes, so I can go ahead and do the mixes easily when, when they are requested. So how many hours would you say that you've got, obviously a big orchestral um, cue is going to take a lot more hours um, than a swampy acoustic guitar cue. Oh, good, so, good, yes. Uh, let's take something in the middle. Let's take a typical, let's take a rock cue mm -hmm. that would have, you know, maybe an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar, maybe a doubled electric guitar, bass, drums, and maybe another instrument in there. Um, how long would a cue like that take from conception to recording to mixing to creating stems, to doing the metadata, um, all the things, if you add up all the time for kind of a mid-level cue, mm -hmm. what's your rough, I, I know they're not all the same, but well, a guesstimate. Let's assume that you're proficient in your DAW, you're proficient right. in performing instruments, so you don't have to do a lot of take. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of takes. Yeah, um, which you proved in the last video. By the way, if you've never seen the video I did with Steve at his home two years ago, watch that, because it's pretty inspiring. It's like two takes at most. <laughs> I mean, I would think for a rock tune, you should be able to get it done in four or five hours. Of soup to nuts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's when, uh, a little less than a full business day. When I was doing a lot of dramedy stuff, um, I was knocking them out in three hours from composing, wow. recording, mixing, er, the works. Because I also had templates, I had formulas, everything was, was pretty much fit in a box. And it was just boom, boom, boom. You know, so if you're doing repetitive stuff, then yeah, it's going to go really fast. Um, when you say templates, you're talking musical templates. Um, well, first of all, a um, a template of orchestral instruments, so I don't have to spend time waiting for the instruments to load into memory in, um, in the DAW. I just go to that track and start playing. So. Something that I've recommended, but I've never had an actual musician maybe uh, expand on this, is that if, if I were doing what you do for a living, and on Monday I did a rock band piece, then rather than Tuesday going to orchestral, if business didn't require me, if my clients weren't requiring me to do that, if I were just creating stuff, I, I would do the same type of track Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, as long as you've got the bass sound, you've got the drum sound, you've got the guitar sounds, create different tempos, different moods, different chord structure, obviously. Um, is that another form of templatism? <laughs> it, it is. I, I mean, for, first of all, get to know your instruments really well. Know them inside and out. Yeah. So then you can just go to them and use them. Because if you have to spend time learning them every time you open up an instrument, you know, you're just wasting a lot of time. So if if you buy a new library, spend two weeks learning it. Wow. And know it. Um, what about gear? 
um, I was in your home studio and you didn't have a lot of our outboard. You didn't have a lot of gear, much like many of our most successful mm -hmm. taxi composers. Um, it seems like you do most everything in the box, obviously, other than adding acoustic instruments on top of stuff or if you're doing, a, you know, like a swampy acoustic guitar cue. Um, is the same thing true for you as far as the gear goes, as far as not having... Um, Will you go to the trouble of having a $2,000 tube compressor on something because you think that gives you some sort of competitive edge against people who don't? Or is it to the point of being ridiculous for this type of work? Yeah, I think that's on the, on the realm of ridiculousness. Okay. <laughs> because, first of all, you've got to understand where your music is going. It's going to be sitting way below dialogue it's way in the background you're not going to hear most of it to begin with <laughs> so yeah come on and the music supervisor or editor on the reality show isn't going to go oh my god listen to the warmth on that electric guitar let's get that guy to give us all the cues we need for next season yeah, doesn't it, happen no <laughs> what you need to focus on is getting the instruments to sound authentic you know as far as the mix quality and stuff it, yeah whether you have a great compressor or a moderate compressor or a crappy compressor probably not going to make that much of a difference in, in what we're doing. I, I got to say, back when I was still in the studio, I would use the compressors on the, the channels of the SSL nine out of ten times because they sounded just fine. Yeah, you get stuff that comes in the box with the DAWs that will probably suffice for 90% of what you do. That's really good advice. Um, uh, Bria just handed me a bunch of questions. That, these folks have been asking. I'm uh, looking to see if there's anything else in my sheet. Uh, eh, I can skip that stuff. Um, so, Paul Croteau at Crow 2. Uh, I can never pronounce your name right, Polly. Sorry. Crow 2? Crow just, call him, just call him Yo Polly. Yeah, Yo Polly. <laughs> um, why isn't there a Kindle version of your book available? Um, it's out of my hands. It's up to the publisher to, uh, to create that. I'm hoping that there will be one soon, um, if enough people are, are buying the book. And you can go to Amazon and request a Kindle version. And if they get enough requests, they'll uh, demand that the publisher does it. Um, Free J. McLeod uh, asks, I've composed 90-second cues, then found taxi briefs uh, saying two minutes minimum. What are your thoughts on that? Every library has different requirements. Um, you know, and, and I got burned with listings too, where I, I, I turned in something and, and it got rejected by the screener saying, you know what, we, we asked for two minutes and you only gave us 90 seconds. We've actually asked the screeners. We didn't know that was going on because it just wasn't something. We have people that, who specifically look at virtually all the critiques going out of here because we like to catch screeners who aren't living up to our standard. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of amazing people that do that. And nobody, it didn't cross anybody's mind until a point where somebody saw it happening repeatedly. So for the last nine months or so, the screeners have been told, look, if it says two minutes and something comes in at a minute 48, don't ding them on that because pretty good chance the library who asked us for two minutes would be a little softer than we're being on it, number one. Number two, if they wanted a longer version, they would say, great job, love what you're doing, can you give me a longer version? Yeah, I would hope that would be the case. Yeah, yeah, I would too, you never know. Yeah, but generally 90 seconds, in my experience, has, has you can't go wrong with 90 seconds. Uh, Carrie Cox asks, is it okay to name your mixes Cup of Sunshine no melody or cup of sunshine 90 second edit etc or does this look amateurish well that's not the name of the of the song that's the name of the audio track that you're you're supplying and you do need to uh, indicate what what they are um i my personal take on it is we get stuff that's submitted to taxi that will say cup of sunshine mix one tuesday p.m alt version four and that's just, a lot of it is the stuff that you guys need to find it on your desktop later or in a file later, and it's not really appropriate to send out to the library that way. 
So my feeling is give them Cup of Sunshine for the first submission, and then when they ask you for, for variants, correct, give them the nomenclature then. Right. The and, and, and often they will have very specific naming patterns that they want you to adhere to. So pay attention to what they re request. Um, you mean as far as like alt mix or, or? They might say Cup of Sunshine underscore full mix, all uppercase, F-U-L-L -L mm -hmm. space M-I-X, something like that. They're very anal about it, and you just need to follow their rules. <laughs> I remember one library owner that we both know from back in the day <laughs> that was very anal about it, but would change with the shifting wind depending on which luncheon uh -huh. you went to or not and drive everybody crazy. It's, no, I never said give it full in all caps. I want you to do it like this. No, really. Yeah. <laughs> I knew a lot of people jumped off of buildings. Um, you know what? Let's listen to another one of your cues. Uh, what would you like to play now? Um, why don't we jump to the swamp one? Just, just because it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I said, is that a harp or being a blues harp? I thought he was doing back draws. <laughs> no, it was, um, and did you play violin as a kid and you, and you no, picked I, it back I, up? Or I just, action? No, I just picked it up a, a year and a half ago. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how hard was that as a grown up? Hard. My daughter had a, a violin as a kid, like in fourth grade or something. Was it like a little small for you? No, I think it was a full size violin. Wow. But Figuring that I'm a guitar player, I've got the left hand. I had, yeah. I couldn't get the bowing. I just, I just, after one day, I said, forget this. Um, but I inherited a violin. And I thought, I'm gonna learn. Okay, so I was out in my garage cleaning up. Have to tell the story. Out cleaning up the garage. You guys already know where I'm going with this, right? Uh, and I find an old violin in a beat-up case. It's clearly like 100 years old. Uh, my parents had sent me a box of stuff and they cleaned out my grandmother's basement or something. And I open it up and I go, ah, I shouldn't even look inside, but I've got to. So I pull out a flashlight and I look inside and it says Stradivarius. And I thought, yay, we're rich. <laughs> and I went online and found out that there are like hundreds of thousands of violins out there that say Stradivarius. Um, <laughs> So pretty sure I'm not rich. Um, oh, I wanted to add during that one, which of course is beautifully executed, the tones on the guitar were superb. A lot of people, when they hear the word composer, they think big orchestral. Wow, it's 5.30 or 5.24. Uh, they think big orchestral, you know, um, Hans Zimmer. Doing that means you're a composer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, Rehab Studio asks, how long do you compose before you take a break? Um, it depends how frustrated I get with... I, I try to power through it and just get it done. Um, if things are going well, I'll just 
go until it's done. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe not more than three hours. And oh, here's a question I, I totally wanted to ask you because uh, can you disclose what your day job is? Um, I am a software engineer. I work at 20th Century Fox. So yeah. it, it's a grown-up big boy job. Yeah. You, you can't. It, it's not like being a, a barista where you can say I only want to work Wednesday afternoons. Right. Yeah. How have you found the time? Because this is a huge issue for people. Mm -hmm. Is finding the time to become this good and have the output that you do and, and still have time to balance your family life, which I know you value your family and you've got kids and grandkids. Um, Leanne ain't going anywhere, been aware of. She's <laughs> sticking around, right? Uh, so you've obviously done a really good job of balancing work, family, and this other work life. How do you do that? Because well, you do it really well. I think. First of all, my, my kids are adults. They're out of the house. Um, we just have the cats. <laughs> yeah, but how many? Tell them how many cats. I'm not. I'm not. I'll tell you my age before I'm telling you how many cats I have. <laughs> and what show have you been on? Oh, my cat from hell. Yes, yes. <laughs> actual person's been on my yeah. cat from hell. Um, so when my kids were little, yeah, oh, it was horrible. It was very, very difficult because I've, I've always worked as a, a software engineer. Um, and, you know, I like having a house and, and having food. And, <laughs> Both good things. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, putting kids through school and stuff. Um, so finding um, work-life balance is really difficult. Um, it's easier but, now because they're gone. But uh, I would imagine because you've got grandkids, and, and I know that you recently moved to a new part of LA to be closer to the grandkids. Uh, I know that when you know uh, our daughter and granddaughter and uh, our son-in-law come over, you know, for Buffalo Chicken Wing Night uh, on Sundays, uh, which happens a lot, you know, they come over at four o'clock and they leave at eight or nine o'clock. That's critical work time right there, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, who's, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't care if our, our daughter or son-in-law come over, it's just about the baby <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, pretty I'm, much, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's like they could just drop the baby off and go on a vacation or something, but um, I, I'm amazed by people like you that can find that time, because if you're going to do a queue and it's going to take four or five hours for a mid-level queue, uh, you know, you, you work all day, and you have dinner with Leanne, and then boom, you're you're starting to work again on a queue at yeah. seven o'clock. The, the key is that you need to be efficient. You can't waste time because you don't have a lot of time. So you got to get as much done as quickly as you can. That also means being less critical about what you put out. That's great. You can't advice. labor over every single note. You know. Because no one's going to, it doesn't matter. In, in, in the, Laurel in, Ostrander is not going to be editing a, an episode <laughs> of Kardashians or whatever she works on yeah, and go, you know, oh my gosh, there, there's a, a, an acoustic guitar squeak in there. Lower your expectations. And, you know, you got to understand what the end game is. You know, you've got to get these cues out. Because it's a numbers game. You have to write a lot of cues. You have to get a lot of cues in libraries. You have to get a lot of placements from those cues. Okay. So it isn't just a lot of cues to write. You've got to go through all those steps. And so your quality's got to be good. And so you need to develop uh, a process where you're, you're putting out the same quality over and over again and quickly. Um, do you go back and look at cues that you did two years ago, four years ago, ten years ago, and, and just shake your head and go, oh, my God, at the time I thought that was great? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. At, at what point does the shelf life run out on cues? Um, I know that about four or five years ago, I started calling up libraries telling them that their orchestral stuff was really dated sounding because it was. And, and frankly, now even orchestral hybrids are sounding somewhat dated mm -hmm. in the context or within that range of hybrids. So clearly libraries need to stay fresh. How often do you feel like you've got a... Well, since I write primarily orchestral music, it's not going to really sound dated other than the sound of the, the quality of the libraries. You don't think that some of the chord structure or melodies, or like the 60s stuff, I mean, it has a sound. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say probably Hans Zimmer is largely responsible. I mean, obviously, some of the right. four well, or five top guys have kind of set the bar in a style. 
So do you need to listen to those people to stay on that, top of it? That's true. There are there are styles where, uh, we like with Hans Zimmer, we've gone away from melody a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, More bombastic and, and exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that 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 does change. Um, more modern sounds, anything with synthesizers, are going to sound dated quicker until 20 years go by, and then they want all the retro stuff. Right. <laughs> Which, it, it just happens every yeah. time. You're right, we're doing 80s stuff right now. Hey, uh, PF Flyer sneakers are back in style. Oh, my God. They are. <laughs> I, keep, I keep seeing them showing up on my uh, Gmail account. Um Okay, so we are at the end of the show. This went, I feel like we should go longer because there's, I still have two pages, no, ah, page stuff. Anyway, um, let's give away a couple of books. Oh, yeah. Um, I asked Steve to bring a couple. I, I really, truly, as you can see between the dog ears and, and the tabs, um, I've been through the book. This book is valuable, and I don't make a penny on it. Um, well, that I, I, I don't either, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, you probably do make out any. <laughs> you know, frankly, uh, because I published uh, some of Robin Frederick's books, I can tell you that uh, publishers are not fans of putting stuff out on Kindle because they're so, because um, they set a price, kind of a ceiling on Kindle, mm -hmm. and, and there's just no money to be made. It's great for the readers mm -hmm. to have it on a Kindle. But there's so little money when they knock the price of a book down in nine ninety nine um, that publishers are, are hesitant to do it. But and frankly, I'm the kind of person that loves to write all over. I know you can mm -hmm. highlight on a Kindle. I love to write in the margins mm -hmm. and dog ear pages and stick post-it notes all over. So I'm a fan of paper books. So here's what we're gonna do is Bria is sitting across the desk from me. Um, I'm gonna tell you guys to type in a plus one. Please don't do it repeatedly because it really kind of it's cheating. Um, just place plus one, and Bria is going to put her finger on there, run it up and down, and go bingo. And wherever her finger lands, that person is going to win a copy of Steve's book. And then we're going to do it one more time because he brought two books that we shall give away today. So, all that said, of some of you started early. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> They're going now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do your thing, Bria. Oh, now they're stopping. <laughs> Good thing we're giving away. You've all been disqualified. Uh, Michael Wilson. Michael Wilson, you got the first one. All right, everybody take a break. We're going to start over clean on this one. Jean Vieux says, here, book, book, book. <laughs> I love it. All right, take a little break, you guys. Take a break. I think some people are a little behind on that. <laughs> Adriana says, yeah, Michael. Yeah, Michael, what? Uh, now they're typing in numbers like 15, 16. I don't, I don't get it. For anybody watching this archive, we're confused. Oh, it's a countdown. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. It's backwards. Paul has actually bought the book. Good man. All right. Yeah, Four, three, two, one. Hit your plus ones now. And guys, any of you who have bought the book on Amazon, please go and, and write a review. I would really appreciate it. Oh, I like that one there. Which one? Is <laughs> flying by. Dan Weber. Dan Weber, you are the other winner. So they'll send me an email at uh, yeah, taxi send, TV at taxi.com. Send an email to taxi TV at taxi.com, and Bria will get your address and stuff and send you out your copy of the book. Congratulations, mm -hmm. winners. Um, can you come back again in, in like a month or two? Because every time I'm with you, I feel like I'm hanging out with one of my old college buddies and we're just having a conversation. Sure. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, God, I'd love to be on the other end of this watching this. So come back. Cause I'm, sure. I've got more and I think they want to learn more. And I'm so... 
Remember when you did the interview with me a couple of years ago, I think, mm -hmm. uh, Passenger Profile? Remember I wrote back and I said you should write a book or something like that? Because right. your answers were so are incredibly articulate that when I heard that you did the book, I was really, really okay. happy. Great. And, and you did a great job on it. I mean, it, it, it's if you just read the glossary, you'd be ahead of the game. I mean, any one section of this book, uh, I, I cannot recommend it. You guys know I never recommend anything that... You know that I want anybody to go out. You're just shilling. I'm not just shilling. The book is that good. So with that, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Steve Barden. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just awesome, awesome stuff, and uh, can't wait to have you back. And you guys, I have no idea what we're doing next week for this show. So I will see you then with another exciting, exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye bye, you guys.